Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome, everyone, once again to the series called The Healing Wounds of Christ. I'm here with the Reverend Joseph Henshi of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. So good morning, Father. Good morning to you, Lisa. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. So, mm-hmm. Father, um, we have begun a very interesting mm-hmm. exploration of the of the obedience of Christ mm-hmm. to God his Father, the abandonment mm-hmm. of his will. Can you just reprise a little bit sure. where we were last time mm-hmm. and where sure. you're going to take us today? Right. As you may remember, this lengthy course on the sacred stigmata is divided into three parts. The first part is the stigma of Good Friday and the slow build-up that leads us eventually to John's Gospel where the Roman soldier desecrated the dead body of Christ by piercing his side. So in this course, or whatever we can call these conferences, the wounded, the open side of Christ is the centerpiece. So everything seems to have led to this, like the grain that has to fall into the ground and die, or the good shepherd who lays down his life and so on. Well, all of this peeks forward to the stigmata, the wounds that are, provide the precious blood for our salvation. So whenever we speak of Jesus Christ and all of this revelation tends toward him and leads away from him so that we will follow after him. At any rate, the old mystics used to say, it's not enough to know God. We must in some way suffer him. Well, if I could use the oft-quoted De Verbum eight. Knowledge of Christ is not just intellectual, it's also experiential. We have to experience Christ. So in that experience, that has led in the history of the Church to an almost infinite number of Christologies, for example, metaphysical Christology, nature and person and relationships and so on. There's also the military Christ. Maybe the Jesuits who had a military background look at Christ more as a captain of their army moving ahead with his banner. Then there is the medical or the healing Jesus, which we're looking at somewhat here. There's also the wisdom teacher coming to town on a donkey and out in a flurry of a royal guard. So all of these things have led us to a specific Christology. And I think mine would be, if I'm smart enough or learned enough to have my own Christology, it's based and flows from the open side of Christ. At least that's the way I I understand it. So the old theologians, in order to develop a theological tract, had what they called theological places. Where do you go when you want to study something in theology? Well, of course, God's Word, both written and oral, the Scriptures and Tradition the magisterium, the fathers of the church, saints, uh, modern society, whatever society we live in helps us to understand. If that runs away with itself, it can end up with an abuse of political theology or liberation theology. Well, it seems that this particular theology, as we see it, begs to be experienced. Mm -hmm. This is not just a theology lesson. Hopefully, it's also meant to be an encouragement to contemplation, a real serious effort to contemplate, to pray these things over. In my own privileged life of academic students, as I've said so many times, I had Father Gary Gould Lagrange, and he taught courses like the Trinity and Eucharist that I still remember. It really seemed to us young kids, I was in my early 20s, that he was meditating the course he was teaching. And that permeated his life, and whatever results I had as a teacher, I really tried to imitate him not to teach unless it had been someone prayed over. So the whole purpose of this, these reflections would be to give a lesson of hope, our failures will be healed and forgiven and forgotten, but also maybe to increase a suggestion or an encouragement to pray, to pray these texts over, to read the scriptures over and over again, So our theological approach would be, of course, the Word of God, 
other theologians, and then in the end to try to ponder the one we have pierced. They will look on the one they have pierced. And this is what my goal is in these things. We will all look on the one we have pierced and mourn him as an only begotten son, but by his wounds ours are healed. So it is indeed a course of hope, and I hope you are able to follow me along somewhat. Yes, well, I think we are. And I think one of the things that is very helpful to me as one of your listeners is the idea that the pierced side of Christ Mm -hmm. helps all of us to understand suffering better, Mm -hmm. to experience it in a way that is more redemptive. Mm -hmm. I think many times Catholic people are seen by outsiders as those that glorify Mm -hmm. in suffering. Mm -hmm. And and perhaps when I was an outsider, I would have thought the Mm -hmm. same, but I don't think that anymore, Mm -hmm. uh, largely. I'm sure because of your teaching mm-hmm. that has it, it our faith gives us a way to cope with suffering which mm-hmm. will come in one form or another mm-hmm. to all of us mm-hmm. and so we're better prepared to unite ourselves to him and mm-hmm. to be healed by what he suffered That's right. and that you you've hit upon another form of christology the so-called dolorist yeah. that somehow i love to suffer Suffering is an evil, right? but whatever Christ assumed, he has redeemed. So that's why the emphasis is the glorious wounds of the apostolic mission on Easter night when he showed his hands and his side and saying, if the, as the Father sent me, I am now sending you. The danger always is to overemphasize the sufferings of Christ, but they were real. And sure. It was a form of suffering in that day that was the most this is an awful form of capital punishment. So it's trying to take into our age where we've seen atomic bombs, we've seen ethnic cleansing, cleansing, we've seen the annihilation, the attempted annihilations of races to promote some kind of a mysterious master race. We've seen all that horror and the beacon of the side, open side of Christ reckon, beacon calls out to us by his wound, by my wounds, yours will be healed. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. <clears throat> so will you begin us with a prayer, and we'll undertake today's topic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this <clears throat> day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, Mother of God, please pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So after all of these reflections on the open side and healing wounds and so on, we come to the effort of modern theology to try to summarize or synthesize Christ in a line. Uh, The mystery of Jesus' filial obedience What is it that constitutes Jesus Christ as a son, as as distinct in the Trinitarian revelation from the Father? Uh, So the mystery of Jesus' filial obedience, the mystery of his abandonment to his Father. Now, it's very hard to keep in mind the very clear teachings of Chalcedon, that Jesus is true God and true man, without confusion, without admixture, These are separate natures united hypostatically in one person. So there are some Christologies that overemphasize the humanity and others that overemphasize the divinity. I think our age has basically considered Christology from the suffering point of view, from the weaknesses, because most people are. Mm -hmm. It seems that much like styles in clothing or styles in music, theology also adapts itself uh, by what people are living and experiencing. So the wounds of Christ then do lead to this great mystery of thy will be done. He didn't have to do this. Right. Well now, and I again, I have a very limited claim on being a theologian, but in my mind, as there are many theologians have come and gone in my lifetime after Garigou Lagrange and the great scholars uh, that came before him, in my mind, Pope Benedict or Cardinal Ratzinger seems to have been a peak point in the development of theology. And I think with him, the late Cardinal uh, designate von Balthasar. 
So I'm trying to stay with the scriptures and trying to look at this, the weaknesses of Christ, especially through his five sacred wounds, which I think were the culminating point of, of all of this. Cardinal Ratzinger tried to, to develop what is it that clearly distinguishes Christ, and he called it constitutional filiation. In the Trinity, as we read from the Council of Lyon, everything is one and the same where there is not the opposition of relationship. Well, the word opposition may be poorly chosen because Christ was not opposed to his Father. In fact, it's the opposite, but it's a distinguishing mark. So how many would have held, as we've seen above, that the culminating point in Christ is loving obedience, Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger thought it was prayer, that Christ is the only person in the Trinity who we see, he went off by himself, he went off by the disciples into the hills to pray. So what is this constitutional affiliation? So to get at this, we have to begin the title Son of God. What does that mean? Abraham was a son of God. Moses was a son of God. And Jesus was a son of God. They were all servants of God, but Jesus is the only natural son of God. The Mm -hmm. rest of us are all adopted children. So the professional faith of the early church, we can understand it in this extraordinary line from Galatians chapter 2. I live now not with my own life, but with the life of Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and who sacrificed himself for my sake. This is the so-called full soteriological formula. God loves me because he sent his Son to die in my place. But we have to put on this mind, put on the mind of Christ Jesus I live now not with my own life, but with the life of Christ who lives in me. So this is not a very uh, a very good comparison, but if you remember the old the movie Saving Private Ryan, mm-hmm. where Tom Hanks' mm-hmm. character um, mm-hmm. dies in search for this mm-hmm. for this man, Private Ryan, and at the end of his of um, in his older age, Private Ryan goes to the grave mm-hmm. of the captain and mm-hmm. says, "I hope I have lived my life mm-hmm. well in your honor." Mm-hmm. And so it's a kind of the same idea is, that actually. that the the captain died for the private. Right. The private the captain's life lived mm-hmm. on in sure. the private, right. as the private tried it to is. do. It's honor. a good it's a good image. It's, it's sacrificial death, substitutionary sacrifice, whatever you want to call it. Call it. The grave at which he was praying was that of an officer, yeah. and this was Private Ryan. Right. So, it, right away there was this. It, we have something like that. Who died for us? The Son of God, the right. natural Son of God. So the symbol is the same, and to imitate Christ, that certainly was one of the ways of doing so, as to all the martyrs and all those who persevere in their Christian calling, people who stay faithful in marriage. Or get up again and try again if they fail. Children who've been abandoned by parents or parents by children. All of these awful things that people that must endure. Christ in some way assumed it and has redeemed it. And in that case, you know, this private, he had the very conscious awareness that mm-hmm. somebody literally had mm-hmm. died, died and he lived. Mm-hmm. So that awareness that mm-hmm. of your of every waking minute mm-hmm. of your day. Mm-hmm. That each moment of your life mm-hmm. is happening because mm-hmm. someone else That's right. died for you mm-hmm. is is the same idea I think Christ right. wants us to have, That's but exactly. it's hard. It's hard Very to hard maintain hard. that that mm-hmm. same level of awareness. I think we have that same thing in the uh, the man for whom Father Colby died. Yes, he was a family man, and Colby said to the prison, the guards, "Look, I don't have a family. Let me take his place." Well, that man was at the canonization, and he was, it was a very <clears throat> emotional meeting between him and Pope John Paul II, that he hoped, you know, that having brought up his family and so on, was worth, worth the sacrifice of Father Colbe. Mm-hmm. So it, it's something that does go on. It's a tale of two cities where the one man gives his life, even though he, they both love the same woman, that he could go and have a good life with this woman that he he also loved. 
So Paul is the only mentions Mary secondarily or in a very uh, distant way in Galatians, the same epistle, chapter 4. When the appointed time came, God sent his Son. Now this is the Son of God. What does that mean? Born of a woman, born a subject to the Torah, the law, and he did it to redeem the subjects of the law and to enable us to become adopted as sons and daughters. These are powerful texts, and when you ponder them and take them word by word and say to yourself, well, wait a minute, this is talking about me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am a child of God. What does that mean? Or as John will say in First John, I think it is, we are already the children of God. But what we are to be in the future has not yet been revealed to us. We don't fully know the glories of the resurrection. So for me, the stigma is a great bridge because there's a sorrowful aspect of the dying Mm -hmm. and the effective aspect of we are redeemed Mm -hmm. also by the resurrection. Mm -hmm. By by his suffering, ours are healed, and by his resurrection, we are saved. So the divine origin of Jesus is fundamental. We sometimes use the word Christian in a very vague way. But if someone doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the natural Son of God and this whole miraculous incarnation and annunciation, then that person really would not be a Christian. He might follow Christian philosophy or something. But to believe that this is the Son of God So the divine origin is so fundamental for Paul that in his letters he most often uses this formulation, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.3, 11.31, Ephesians 1.3, Colossians 1.3, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is Father of every human being as creator, but he's Father of Jesus in a unique manner. This unique filiation of Jesus has been revealed so that those who try to remain faithful might remain sharers, participants in the divine nature as adopted children. So Paul is very strong on this point, that Jesus died as the Son of God. Mm -hmm. But of course the crown prince of filiation and divine paternity would be St. John's Gospel. Uh, For example, in Matthew... Uh, the word Father relating to God is 64 times, in Mark 18 times, in Luke 56 times, but in John 137 times. Yeah. So it's a real emphasis, the Heavenly Father and the natural Son of God. Well, this reminds me of my my hospice patient who has just died, uh, is a man I to whom I had been reading mm. the Bible at mm. his request and he had been a street preacher in mm. his in his uh, earlier days. The first gospel he had me read was John. Mm-hmm. And he had very few words he could get out. But when I was done with the gospel of John, I said to him, what did you want me to learn from reading this gospel mm-hmm. to you? When you were preaching, what did you want your listeners to learn mm-hmm. from hearing these words? And he simply said, that Jesus was the true Son of God. That's it? He's right on. He was a good exegete, a very good exegete. <clears throat> so, in John's theology, these themes become abundantly clear. It's, it's a message of central importance. The whole purpose of his writing seems to be is that everyone might believe and live the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 20.31 and 1 John 5.13 For John, the most characteristic title for God is Father. As can be noted from the extraordinary frequency of the term Father in John's writings, 137 times. This can be noted uh, correspondingly, there is also a frequent reference to Jesus as Son, the only begotten Son of God. In John 2 and 2 John, the author is able to formulate his own compendium of all of these truths and to express his basic theology in these terms. In our life of truth and love, we shall have grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. So that's the third epistle uh, attributed to St. John, verse 2. So 
So this is the fundamental Johannine vision, divine filiation. Some texts of John permit the committed believer to determine even further the origin of Jesus' filial consciousness. For example, 1030, 1711, and 22, I and the Father are one. Between them, there's what theologians call a perfect reciprocal immanence. They mutually indwell indwell one another perfectly. We believe in the indwelling of the most blessed trinity in our souls. But that was super added to us, technically, theologically. Grace is an accident. We weren't born with it. Mm -hmm. It was added to us after birth. So, But here we find this development of, while there's no confusion, and no separation. There is a distinction between the Father and the Son, but they perfectly inhere or adhere to one another. The Father and I are one. As a result, we can state that Jesus has an immediate, absolute, experiential knowledge of the truth of of the Father, although that last term is more or less involves human knowledge. I know him because I come from him. And it was he who sent me. So these are verb tenses are very important. I still come from him. He has sent me, but I still one with him. <clears throat> so Jesus, the one who has come from the Father, who is with the Father, has come and is present in our world. This is all throughout John's Gospel. And he also maintains that Jesus Jesus maintains that he's going now to return to the Father. He goes to be with the Father. On the day of the resurrection, Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, I am ascending to my father and your father, Mm -hmm. clearly distinguishing the two relationships without any exaggeration that the filial relationship of Jesus with his father, this is his existential manner of living his closeness to the father. This is the mystery of Christology. Anyone can die. Anyone can carry a cross to be one with the Father as a divine person in a human nature is unique to Jesus Christ. This is the core of our Christian faith. This is the genuine heart of the message. This is what is of supreme importance of Johannine Christology. The entire profound life of Jesus Christ is ever orientated, either coming from or returning to, turning toward the Father as long as he lives from which he comes into the world and returns to him after fulfilling the Father's mission. This is filial life, which he has come to reveal to us. But it is also of extreme importance for our life of adoptive filiation. These are two basic ideas that John has been able to bring out in a few words. Jesus really is the Father of Christ, and Christ really is the Son of this Divine Father. So we read in one eighteen in the prologue, no one has ever seen God. It is only the Son who is nearest to the Father's heart who has made him known. That text, Father Raymond Brown does a real good deep study on this. In the Latin Vulgate, it used to be in sinu patris, in the Father's bosom. We would kneel down at the creed, in sinu, he's been conceived in the bosom of the Father. But that would seem to be kind of passive and so on. But Father Brown says it really means who's turning toward the Father. His entire life is turning toward the Father. What is the life of an adoptive child of God to return to the Father? So it's that prologue that we are trying to imitate. We are, are we nearest to the Father's heart? That's probably the the, uh, what he called the ascetical way of translating this, but the ontological, what, what, is, what is theology teaching us here, that Jesus is turning toward the Father his entire life until he returns to the bosom of the Father. It is Jesus through his open son, side has opened the way to return to the Father. So the only begotten of God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he is the one who has made the Father known to us. Do we, by our lives, Jesus said, whoever sees me sees the Father. Can we glory in the fact that anyone sees me would be reminded of Christ? No, not yet. 
But the Lord is beckoning us to follow this way. The only begotten Son is eternally turned toward the Father, toward the bosom of the Father. He has revealed him to us. It's interesting. Even though Jesus was sinless, we find that Jesus is the great model of penitence because he constantly confessed the Father. This is my Father and made clear that we understood he's a God of love, a God of mercy, and all of these things. <clears throat> but in the end, that was his fundamental uh, revelation. We are called to be turning toward the Father, even in sin, to turn back and say, Father, forgive me, but I did not know what I was doing. Or the, the one, when the, uh, the prodigal son comes back, Father, forgive me, for I have squandered what you gave me. Take me back, I'll take care of the pigs. Yes, yes. Well, and and I think I read this first in in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm. He makes the comparison, certainly as a, a man who lived mm. uh, in the First and Second World Wars, mm. that Jesus came to us like a like a paratrooper mm. into enemy territory. Mm. He had come from freedom. Mm-hmm. We were mired in slavery, mm. oppression mm. by the enemy. Mm. And he led a way out, like like building a tunnel mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. And the orientation is always out, out of the tunnel, mm-hmm. not in the tu- not mm-hmm. in the the mm-hmm. prison or in the mm-hmm. concentration camp, but out mm-hmm. towards freedom. Mm-hmm. And so his orientation is always out towards the mm-hmm. Father and beckons uh, us to follow him. That we've been blessed in our age with wonderful uh, writers like C.S. Lewis, probably basically not never would have considered himself a theologian, but he certainly had some extraordinary insights into God. So I think anyone who believes and prays is a theologian. Yes. We all have different levels, different possibilities of academic background, but anyone who prays carries his or her cross, perseveres in a difficult task that they believe is from God, is truly a theologian. And the old Eastern theologians used to say, if you are a theologian, Pray that you don't get proud. And if you are praying, you are already some level of a theologian. So to live the message, this is what we're trying to do. So most exegetes would prefer to emphasize this aspect of the sons revealing the Father. The third translation above suggested the more the inner Trinitarian relationship of Jesus toward his Father as a dynamic sense of turning eternally toward the Father. And this is where we have trouble with Chalcedon. There's no confusion, there's no admixture, there's one person and two natures. It's an extremely difficult. So what we have here is this bridge, we might say, between the divinity and the uh, humanity by Christ's prayer, by his loving obedience toward the Father. Recent studies in philology bring out this idea that Jesus has returned to the bosom of the Father. The emphasis, though, is now Jesus is with the Father as he was all the time he was on earth. He was turning toward the Father on the way to the Father, quiesced in sino patris, who is in the bosom. This constant turning toward the Father for all eternity is a model of all penitence, Christ, the sinless one, our model. When we kneel and confess him, because he's confessing the name of God as we confess his mercy. We come as sinners before the mercy of God. Therefore, the act of revealing God the Father, some see that the evangelist here has referred to the historical permanent state of Jesus. A close analysis of the Greek state seems to indicate that John is not only insisting upon Jesus' situation in this world, but he's revealing to us the eternal situation. He's still revealing the mercy of the Father. He's living the eternal situation that is never interrupted. He is one with the Father. Therefore, Jesus remains the way, the truth, and the life. He's the guide for all wayfarers, persevering, faithful on the way to the Father. Jesus has indeed opened this all up, particularly through the opening of his sacred side. Read in the New Catechism, number 112. It's a beautiful number. The uh, heart of Christ might be understood as the scriptures, which are opened by the wounds of Christ. So it might be seen better now the relationship 
between the two parts of this one passage. One of the verbs is in the present tense and the other is in the past tense. <clears throat> John, in the moment on which he's writing his gospel, composes the ch- this challenging prologue. First tells us that the believer tells the believer that Jesus Christ is indeed for him as the evangelist is personally involved in his privileged witness. He was a faithful disciple and he provided the church a believing testimony of what he saw and what he heard in 1 John 1, chapter 1, verses 1 and following. I want to tell you about something that existed from the beginning, someone we heard, someone we touched, And that's what we try to do as Christians and what we're trying to do in this course to make the wounds of Christ so real that in a certain sense we can see the way to freedom that you spoke of. The door to freedom is the open side of Christ. I remember facetiously some years ago I went to see a very devout Baptist eye doctor in Nashville, Tennessee. He's the one that first told me I had some serious double vision problem. But anyway... His office was a quaint little place and that had five doors. So I had all these liquids in my eyes and I couldn't see well. And I'm fumbling around to get out. He says, Reverend, that door to the right is the highway to freedom. <laughs> so I often thought of that wonderful man of Nashville, Tennessee, 40 years ago, telling me the way to freedom. And I already knew it, being a stigmatin. Anyway, in the light of the post Easter faith, John reflects on the past and seeks to summarize the entire Christ event in one single word. Some scholars would choose this translation, God, Jesus, has opened up the way to the Father for all of us. With this one verb, John would be introducing his entire gospel. Jesus is the only Son nearest to the Father's house, constantly turning toward the Father, has now returned to his Father, where he would greet us in our resurrection and our welcome into the celestial sanctuary at the end of time. Therefore, Jesus' entirely earthly sojourn has been indicated this way, turning toward the Father. And the open sign of Christ is the doorway. By contemplating, praying, as dear St. Gaspar Batoni, the Sigmatine founder, said, if you look for me, look for me in the open side of Christ. That's where I remain. That's where I pray. That's where I contemplate. Therefore, we understand now, hopefully on a deeper level, Jesus is the way, the only way, the only truth, the only life. We can have all good things and be rich with all kinds of stuff, and then we get a a report of a bad blood. Or we think life is perfect, or life is the other way. It's just awful. Endless situations that are absolutely impossible. Areas of life in groups of people, the nonsense, almost the despair in human life. But Jesus, his entire life is described as a journey, an exodus, a pilgrimage, a liturgical procession, going home to the Father. So the entire church in her life, assisting believers, disciples, the crowd, needs to follow in his footsteps. Those three categories, by the way, are three levels of uh, following Christ. He can be a member of the crowd at a distance. He can be something of a disciple. But God is calling us all to be believing apostles, to communicate his word by the way we live. So put in other words, what John is trying to get across to us is that the life of Jesus was constantly, fundamentally, every day, made known in an intensifying manner as filial, filiation. In other words, take up the cross every day. This is what filiation means. Thy will be done is to carry out the will of God whether we're battling cancer or in-laws or outlaws or Mm -hmm. unhappy neighbors or whatever is the struggle in life, struggling to keep a marriage together, all of these things are eminently blessed by God. He knows what we are made of. He knows that we are dust. So this spirit of Jesus among us is clearly made known to us as a time of filiation. Precisely this unique relationship to the Heavenly Father is the foundation the support, the source, the fountain of our entire lives and our earthly sojourn, we are called to an ever-increasing life of loving filiation to a merciful Father. 
There is thus comprehended a kind of an overall description on the ultimate end and the sublime meaning of Jesus' earthly life. And, and there is here an in, implicit indication of his prayer. He spent his whole life in prayer over and over again. I think there are a hundred texts in the New Testament where Jesus went off in the night or early morning or midday alone or with others to pray. He is the only begotten Son in his entire earthly existence, constantly, consistently on his way toward his heavenly Father. As a result, his prayer of necessity had to be directed toward his loving Father. His prayer is sublimely filial. He does pray as a servant, Thy will be done. But his final words are, Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. This is a filial prayer. So all of this shows clearly the significance of Jesus' life and his prayer. This, that is, have inspired believers of all ages. Jesus' prayer is a prayer of the divine Son of God. That's already a mystery. He's totally equal, co- totally co-eternal, all of these things, but yet he's constantly praying to his Father. <clears throat> In this, there is revealed the essential core of the mystery of Jesus Christ. He is manifested to the faithful as one who is on his way toward his heavenly Father and as one who opens his path for us. Well, symbolically, that open side is the gateway to the union with the merciful and loving Father or to share in Christ. It's adored into the sanctuary of the celestial altar where Christ is offering already the thanksgiving for the mercy of God. This is existential, and this is what we mean by constitutional filiation. For many, it's loving obedience. For others, it's an attitude of continual prayer. Jesus, in his human nature, remains always in relationship with his heavenly Father. Our prayer is epitomized and summarized in the fundamental first petition of the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done, actually the second petition. So this is the personified prayer. This is what Jesus is, personified prayer. This is filial consciousness of his human life. This is his existential reality of the life of Christ. So filial consciousness of the historical Christ, believers need to contemplate these texts. What do they mean? Is this just a repetition of the same truth? Is it beating a dead horse? Is it a repetition of something now that's beyond any further grasp. Every word needs to be pondered and looked at and prayed over and asked the Lord, how can we live this? How can we do this? How can we be on the way to eternally turn toward the Father? So this title does indicate the essential prerogative of Jesus Christ for many in his personal filial consciousness. So to take up the question of what is the existential reality of Christ's consciousness can only have meaning in this fourth gospel or the highest level of revelation we have. Jesus is the Son of God, and this is what we mean by his filial consciousness, both on earth, prior to Easter, and ever since after Easter. So today it can be stated without any fear of error that Jesus spoke of God so often as his Father, in a sense that context makes very unique to him. In all four Gospels, Jesus clearly distinguishes between my Father and your Father. My Father, Matthew uses both formulations in one and the same chapter at a distance of only a few verses from one another. This is when Jesus was lost. My, did you not know that I had to be about my That's father's right. business? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She said, your father and I have sought you sorrowing. Why did you do this to us? And what Jesus is revealing is the true family of God, anyone who does the will of my father. And no one did that better than Mary. So this distinction is all the more striking, especially what he said to Mary Magdalene on the first day of the resurrection, John twenty seventeen. In his prayer, Jesus employs in addressing himself to his Father is a formula which has no real equal in any Jewish piety with reference to God. Abba, Daddy, Papa, or some loving term. Abba, my Father. And most likely when we pray the Our Father, that's what we mean. We're trying to say, you are in heaven. 
For God's sake, help me. Help mm-hmm. me to get there. So <clears throat> this use is so struck the first Christian communities, which uh, Paul asks its faithful to repeat their prayers with this Aramaic prayer of Jesus himself. It's interesting that this is found first, it seems, in Mark's Gospel. Now remember, Mark was like Lucy and Charlie Brown. Every mistake Peter made, Mark wrote it down. And he does remember Jesus praying in the, in the garden and has a faint recollection. He used the word Abba. And that's the first, then Paul picks it up from Mark. Anyway, that's his, that's his hypothesis. How did this, Jew, there's no record of it anywhere else in Jewish piety, they tell us. But it's clearly here and then repeated by Paul. When you pray, say, Abba, my father. So <clears throat> this revelation of Jesus' father is because he knows that he is really and truly God's only begotten, most beloved son. It is probable that Jesus is not qualified directly as the son of God, but in the greater part of the text he defines himself as the son He's not just the better, the greater, or the biggest, or the oldest, or most. He's son in the absolute sense in which the rest of us participate. So the first of these texts, sometimes called the Synoptics Hymn of Jubilation, helps us to understand better that which the filial consciousness of Jesus would have meant when he said, everything has been given to me by my Father. This is the Hymn of Jubilation, found in the Synoptic Gospels. So we find here that Jesus may be quoting Daniel of Daniel 7.14 with this title of the Son of Man. Jesus knows him and he knows who is his Father. So fundamentally we think the highest revelation we have is that of John. So in John 1, there's a question each one of us could ask. Where do you live, Lord? Where are you? John 1, 38. In a commentary from the early Middle Ages, there was a William of San Thierry, who was a friend and biographer, biographer of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, a monk. And he ponders this, where do you remain? And of course, St. Thomas noted that that verb remain is used about faith, hope, and charity. There are three virtues which remain, and the greatest of these is charity. In, in First uh, Corinthians. So where do you remain? William develops that very beautifully. He says, I remain in the Father, and the Father remains in me. In Greek, that's called perichoresis, which is a kind of an indwelling. Jesus' union with the Trinity is called hypostatic. Yours and mine union with the Trinity would be called personal grace. Mm-hmm. It means the same. There is a person uniting, but Christ is absolutely natural. The true Son of God, yours and mine, is a kind of an application or a kind of a, a adoptive filiation. So, <clears throat> so often it is frequently understood to say, where is your home? Well, this is meaning he's, he's in heaven. Our Father in heaven. But the Father remains in me and I remain in the Father. This is the perichoresis, the lifelong indwelling of the Most Blessed Trinity. So there is a text here from William of Thierry. I'll just read it quickly. O heavenly truth, you have responded to me. I beg you, Rabbi, where do you live? Come, he said, and you will see. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? May thanks be rendered to you, O Lord, because we have progressed not a little way. We have found your home here in the monastery. Your Father is your dwelling place, and you are where the Father dwells. Beginning with this privileged place within the Father, you, O God, are localized. However, this is a most sublime locality, far more sacred than any absence from a place. This locality consists in the unity of the Father and the Son in the consubstantiality of the Trinity. So I believe that our great symbol of this doorway is the open side of Christ. Look for me in the side of Christ and that you'll find me contemplating the Trinity. Well, and it's wonderful when you talk about all of this to, to say that Christ remains always with the Father mm-hmm. And then there is that wonderful quote where Christ says to all of us, 
I am with you always until the end of the age. And that's so. exactly what contemplation does. It brings together, like Mary treasured in her heart, it means she compared the text. She heard the angels singing in the sky and looks at this kid in the crib. And she didn't understand that this is the Savior of the world. What does that mean? <laughs> Your own sword, a sword will pierce because he's set for the rise and fall of many. What? This kid born in the barn? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So what contemplation does is to try to get a global understanding of Scripture. And you do that especially by praying. But any way we can, taking in hand God's Word every day if we can, at least in the Mass and hearing the Scriptures, and when possible to pray the Holy Bravery. Well, and you, you think too about the the epiphanies that people had. This is mm-hmm. this is the Son of God, mm-hmm. the one we think of the Magi and mm-hmm. the shepherds mm-hmm. uh, at the birth of Christ, mm-hmm. and then the centurion at the end, yeah. who says, "This truly, so this really is was the Son, Son of God." God. So mm-hmm. that that sense of of it all is. Um, it's hard to grasp. It's hard to take it in, is. and yeah. it's hard to, it's hard to remember. You know, you you said something yesterday that was interesting. That for all of us human beings tied to this earth, tied to a place, a time, uh, a, a particular lifetime, our tendency is to look down and in at ourselves. Mm-hmm. But the the exhortation of Christ is look up and out. Sorsum cordo. Is that yeah, it? <laughs> that's what it is. Lift up your heart. Yes. It's very interesting. Some of the theologians of hope would compare the philosopher who said, cogito ergo sum, mm-hmm. I think, therefore I exist. Mm-hmm. Or as they say, spero ergo sursum, I'm going up. So it is, uh, hope is a future good, difficult, but possible. But possible, and that mm-hmm. and that is the orientation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Christ wants to keep with us. This is the journey, the and, way, the truth, and the life. And it's also that sense too, when you think about it, that as a great rabbi and teacher, Jesus could have set up in Jerusalem or anywhere, probably mm-hmm. for that matter, and established mm-hmm. a a place, a school of yeah. teaching. People would come to him, but yeah. that's not what he did. Yeah. He he kept moving mm-hmm. and kept saying to people, "Follow me." Mm-hmm. Even even after death, keep following me, so that he didn't mm-hmm. he didn't disappear, mm-hmm. the way the way teachers who live and die disappear. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. he keeps mm-hmm. on the move, and there are so many of the mm-hmm. stories, like in Samaria or at Emmaus, the people who encounter him say, "Stay, stay, mm-hmm. stay, just a little while," but he keeps move going. Move he move keeps on. going. Yeah, that's right. So it's the same with each of us, I guess. We'd like to slow down a bit and catch our breath. But he's asking us to keep on, keep going, because the celebration waits us in heaven for all eternity. So <clears throat> what does it mean to dwell in me? I dwell in him, he remains in me. Well, this is a very difficult theological question. As I've mentioned a few times, the technical word is perichoresis the mutual indwelling of the Most Blessed Trinity. We all imitate this meekly, meagerly, by our own state of grace. But in this situation, we find that, I remember some of the great writers would say, the best theology is the state of grace. That if you want to be a theologian, pray, contemplate, contemplate, uh, uh, study, heed the teachings of the Church, and live this experience. As we've said so many times, if we have deep prayer and no study, it can get funny. But if we have much knowledge and no prayer, it tends almost inexorably to pride. Yes. And it can be a stumbling block instead of being the cornerstone of everlasting life. Well, I think, too, it's the, the, the challenge you bring up is one where what are what are we doing when we're studying? We're, we're often thinking about ourselves, our mm-hmm. own knowledge mm-hmm. and absorption. When we pray, we're thinking about right. God. Mm-hmm. So it's so mm-hmm. it's easy to see why mm-hmm. too much study could lead to pride because yes. you're focused mm-hmm. on the accumulation mm-hmm. or the deepening of understanding mm-hmm. in your own mind. Mm-hmm. But but prayer is what's always pushing you out. Mm-hmm. It's interesting too. The fathers of the church were extraordinarily brilliant people. 
and yet very humble. Yeah. Uh, saying ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Or when we pray, we talk to God. When we read his word, we listen to him. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we get out of all of this. And this is not just theology. I think anybody with the time I've had could do this and much better. So I, I'm often encouraged by the imaginary listeners to all of this. Anyone who would listen to this at any length is searching. Hang on, kid. It's a bumpy ride, but we're all still on. The, we're all on the same journey. So, therefore, in the text of John, the relationship between the only begotten, most beloved Son, is not focusing on the eternal God within God, staying in an excessively trinitarian level. They distinguish this between the so-called economic economic trinity and the imminent trinity. That doesn't mean one of the trinities is cheap. Mm-hmm. There's one trinity. You could look at him in within himself, as Augustine and Thomas did with relationships and natures and so on. Or you could see it as what the trinity did. Everything outside of God is common to all three persons. The, the relationships within is what distinguishes them. But whatever they did, creation, redemption, sanctification is all three persons of the Trinity. This is their epiphany. For all attentive and faithful believers, he is indeed the Son of God, the eternal Word, who comes from God, in whom God is uniquely present, and who is constantly turning toward God as long as he was on this earth. Jesus is our great model, and divine grace helps us to bring the imperfections of our own adoptive filiation to make them more perfect as we try to follow Jesus Christ until our dying day. Well, therefore, this filial consciousness is at the core of Jesus' sacred humanity. And beginning with this theology, they develop devotions such as the sacred heart and the sacred stigmata in their most profound depths. Theologians can fearlessly proclaim If a student begins in the pure, abstract, historical objectivity from a historical grasp of the Gospels, it will always be impossible to risk any leap into the mystery from which springs the sublime and dynamic faith of the Church. This is the mystery of filial consciousness that Jesus had of himself, the mystery of Jesus' filial, divine, natural consciousness of his filiation, is the springboard for the mystery of the sacred heart, the sacred stigmata, and sheds infinite life on the mystery of Jesus' prayer. He wanted us to be with him. Father, may those be with me, and may they be with me all days, as I will be with them in the consummation of this world. So this can make sense only to a committed believer, the one who stays with you. Don't succeed today, try tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And as Teresa Bible will tell us, failure is very often the last attempt uh, are the, uh, turned inside out, success, failure becomes a success. Thus, this can make sense only to one who's really committed to this and picks up and tries and tries again. And in the grace of God's gift of final perseverance, we will reach everlasting life. So what this does is prolong the Christology of Chalcedon. And in this, I just tell you to read that Council of Chalcedon of 451. There are many places you can find it. I'm sure you can find it on uh, the internet. Just the Council of Chalcedon and its decrees. They are most extraordinarily difficult. But <laughs> it's two natures, one person, one single hypostasis. The formula of Chalcedon would imply for some scholars a missing sufficient recognition of the historical dimension of Jesus Christ. This is a man who lived on this earth, but he was God. He was God on this earth. Perfectus in humanitate, perfectus in divinitate. He was perfect in his humanity and perfect in his divinity. What it asks for, Chalcedon was a point of arrival, as is any definition. But it's also a point of departure for the mystic for further contemplative study. So these texts, read them. I think the first time through you'll be stunned. No. <laughs> What's this mean? Read every word and see what it's trying to tell us. It's, it's a stepping stone to further prayer and more sublime contemplation. So Chalcedon makes very clear 
that one and the same Jesus Christ enjoyed two natures in one person, one single hypostasis. So this dimension of Christ is what we struggle to understand. This is what we mean by constitutional filiation. Many well-known theologians are moving in this direction. We cannot surpass Chalcedon, but we can go beyond it in our own prayer and spiritual lives under the guidance of the Church. Chalcedon was a giant step forward in the understanding of Christology, but it still needs to be understood Mm -hmm. before we try to move on to something else. So try looking up in your computers, Chalcedon, C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N, the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So the theological task is that of showing that the historical dimension of the hypostatic union of two natures in one divine person is to make this more and more evident to the intimate bond between that which is historical and that which is beyond history. We are citizens of two worlds. We're living in this world but tending to an the one future which has already begun by the state of grace. Others wish to take up and develop this thrust even further. Applying more directly to the theme emphasizes the divine origins of Jesus Christ as so the descending Christology and the ascending. The problem with the descending, very often it never reaches humanity. He's always walking on water, multiplying the fishes and the bread. The problem with ascending Christology, very often it does not get up to heaven in its Arianism. It's a form of neo-Arianism. So the proposal to prolong Chalcedon would lead to a fuller recognition of the Greek word perichoresis, the union of the divinity and the humanity in the will and human operations of Jesus Christ, which penetrates his divine will and his actions. And we want to imitate this in our appreciation of grace. Therefore, not to tempt anyone to give up the state of grace to do all we can to encourage one another in the dark times, the difficult times, the times when faith is very hard to maintain. Never to give up, to keep on trying till the day we die. <clears throat> so once again, Maximus, the confessor, who wasn't really a martyr, but he really was, because he suffered horrendously for his faith, he's the one who said there were two wills in Christ. Not my will, but thine be done. He did that. He was unable to make that great insight which is now very evident to all of us believers by contemplation. He studied and realized there are two wills. Otherwise, the human nature of Christ would be uh, a a robot or an automaton or whatever you call it, or something that's run by a machine. So Jesus Christ, this divinity, penetrates his will in action. I'll begin to wind down this reflection by thinking of Maximus the Confessor. By his meditation on Gethsemane, he realized there was a human will and a divine will acting together in Gethsemane. Not my will be done, but thine, O Lord. That even though they're separate from each other, they're never distinct, they're distinguished from each other, they're never separated. There's a perfect harmony of Christ's human activity and his divine power. Of one of his two natures, united without exit the other, penetrated this completely. Nothing was accomplished outside of the action. All the actions of God are those of a divine person. So we do not accept the brilliant theologian Moltmann in his crucified God, in which he said it at Gethsemane and Calvary, there was a separation of the hypostatic union. Jesus died on the cross as the Son of God and had led us into heaven through the open side of his wounds. Well, so this is very, mm. uh, very helpful, Father, and um, and of course is one of these mysteries that is impossible to really penetrate and contemplate. Mm. We go back to your image from Saint Augustine of of the boy putting the ocean in in a hole mm. in the beach. It's just <clears throat> not possible. But to, to muse over it mm-hmm. and to think about its nature and I guess surf on it, you could mm-hmm. say sure. a little bit, yeah. is all we can mm-hmm. we can truly do and keep doing it mm-hmm. all our lives. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, the, the old adage was scrutamini scripturas, meaning ponder over the pages of God's word. Every word, as origin tells us, is an ocean in which we are meant to be baptized or immersed to ponder the mystery. 
Yes, yeah, so or I think too about that idea that the Dalai Lama has expressed to grow in compassion. Put yourself a little outside your comfort zone every day and never hurry and never rest. Mm-hmm. So we keep going. We keep going. Lord Jesus turning toward his father asks us to come follow him. So will you finish us with a prayer today? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church. Pray for us. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, and thank you once again for teaching, Father. And thank you for listening to all this. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.